Hi, everyone. I am Kenny Coogan. I am part of the IUCN SSC Anteater Sloth and Armadillo Specialist Group. And we call that group Xenarthrins. And uh, if you love Xenarthrins like I do, you can go visit our website, xenarthrins.org. We also have a very active Instagram and Facebook accounts, and we have a brand new YouTube page that we encourage you to visit. Past webinars are posted there. If you can't attend a webinar live, you can go there and see uh, the past webinars. They're usually published a couple of days after the live event. But the benefit of you coming to the webinar is that you get to ask the expert questions. So this is a little uh, screenshot of our website, zenarthrins.org. We talk about all of the species in uh, each of the genera that make up the zenarthrin group. And what's really exciting is that last month was in one day, uh, the third Saturday in October was International S Sloth Day. We made a video, an animated video to educate everyone, children and adults, but what's even more special is that we don't have it just in English, we also have it in Spanish, and we also have it in Portuguese. So you can share it with your colleagues, your friends, children, adults, anybody who you think would benefit from these great educational resources. Something else that we did for International Sloth Day was create coloring sheets, puzzles, uh, can you spot the difference activities, uh, word searches, and of course all of these are in English, Spanish, and Portuguese as well. Uh, coming up, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but November 19th is International Anteater Day, and you can expect the same thing. We're going to have a animated video and worksheets for that day. If you go uh, visit our Facebook page, you'll see that we have uh, the upcoming webinars. We like to do one a month. However, for December, because of the holidays, we pushed the uh, December webinars to November. So we have three weeks in a row of webinars all about Xenarthrins. If you feel inspired by the webinars or educational outreach, you can go to our website and click the donate button and that helps uh, save wild places where these animals live. We would like to thank our partner institutions, FIA, the Foundation for International Aid to Animals, and Nurtured by Nature for sponsoring our webinars and our educational content. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, International Anteater Day is coming up in a couple of weeks. It's November 19th. International Sloth Day is a floating holiday. It's always on a Saturday, but International Anteater Day is always on the same date, November 19th. If you're following our social media pages, you'll see that artists from all over the world, people who do ceramics and paintings and cloth art are sending us uh, their anteater inspired art, and then we're sharing that on our pages. So if you have any anteater art, feel free to send us a message through uh, Instagram or Facebook. All right, so we have Erin Earl. She's going to be talking about the secret life of the giant anteater. If you are attending this session live, please go to the bottom of the window and click uh, the chat button to type your questions there. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Erin Earl. And I'm here talking to you from the South Rupununi in Guyana. And I'm representing the South Rupununi Conservation Society. So I'll talk a lot more about our society as we go along. But today I'm giving you a discussion on the secret life of giant anteaters. And this is all about community led research and conservation that we're doing down in the Rupununi in Guyana. So first of all, um, I know a lot of people aren't really too familiar with Guyana. So here is um, Northern South America. You can see here on the left, Venezuela, Guyana, then Suriname and French Guyana. 
So here I have outlined the, um, the region that we work in, which is the Rupununi. And in terms of area, this is about 5.8 million hectares. So it's about similar or a little bit bigger than Costa Rica. But in terms of human population, the total population of this whole area is only about 24,000 people. So that's about 200 times fewer than a place like Costa Rica. Um, and if we, if we look, you can see on the east, um, we are um, all rainforest. On the west is Brazil, savanna and rainforest. And then to the north, um, more rainforest. But ourselves in the savanna here, um, this is open grasslands with small islands of forest and bordered by mountains to the north and rainforest to the east. And I've put here some of the communities that we work in. So these are small indigenous communities, a few hundred people each, and they mainly are in the savanna, but bordering the forest, because people, of course, use the rainforest and for um, farming, subsistence agriculture, hunting, subsistence hunting, and for materials, for um, building, for crafts, for medicines. Now, our headquarters as a society is right in the center of the South Rupununi. So here we have Wichabai Ranch. Um, and this is where we have our base. Even though we work in all the villages, this is our headquarters. And you can see here we have open savanna. This is all savanna. And then we have these patches of bush islands. They are little patches of forest, um, like an island of forest surrounded by this ocean of savanna. And these bush islands are really important for the people who live in the savannas. They are used for um, materials, for hunting. Um, and they're also, of course, used by the many species of animals that live there. So I will talk more about the importance of these habitats as we go along. So here's an example. This is Wichabai, right? This is one of our rangers looking out over the landscape. We've got these beautiful mountains, open savanna, and then these small enclaves of forest that are so important to the habitat. Some of the mountains are bare at the top. Here's another one of our rangers climbing up Wee Chow. And behind him, you can see the open savanna stretching out, beautiful mountains, savanna and the, um, the forest along the creeks and in the, um, these little bush islands. It's a really beautiful, really exceptionally lovely uh, landscape. So as I said, it's, it's um, a lot of small indigenous villages. Here's an example um, of an ordinary um, community, this, this part of a community, um, as well as subsistence, hunting, agriculture and small businesses. There's also a lot of ranching, but this ranching is completely extensive. So you will not find any fences. There's no improved pasture. It's basically just cattle roaming the land completely freely. Um, and it's not very um, impactful on the, the ecosystem at all. And this is um, these are two photographs of one of our founding members of the SRCS. This is Asaf Wilson. On the left, here he is doing his, um, his normal stuff, hunting. He's a farmer, he's a fisherman, um, but at the same time, he's a conservationist. Um, and also, of course, very much part of the modern world. So a lot of people who are living in this area are balancing these two things, traditional and modern life, kind of fusing them together. So now I can say a little bit about the South Rupanuri Conservation Society. So this society is 20 years old now, um, and I've been part of it since 2006. So if you look at this picture, this is a picture um, taken of some of our members a couple of years ago. And you can see that most people, or in fact, pretty much everybody except for me, um, are uh, members of the local villages, indigenous people. But I became involved actually in 2006 when I first came to the Rupununi. And I met the man who was the, at that time, the president of the society. 
And anyway, we later got married, we have a son, um, but we sort of fell in love over this little bird, this little red siskin, which was the, um, the main focus of the Conservation Society at that time. And um, my now husband used to take me out to look for these little birds. Um, and anyway, I'm still here. So this is how we started. We started the Conservation Society protecting this little red siskin which was discovered in, in um, the South Rupununi 20 years ago, which was amazing because it was critically endangered, it was near extinction. But since then, the work of the Conservation Society has brought this, um, this bird species back from the brink um, and it's no longer on the critically endangered list. So that's a real success story for us. Um, and in the last few years, leading on from that success, we have started working with other species. So, as well as the red siskins, we do research and conservation of yellow spotted river turtles. We have environmental education classes in I think it's 16 schools now. We also run traditional knowledge classes um, where young people gain knowledge from elders who teach them different skills and knowledge um, in the village. We do in um, conservation and research of two wonderful birds called the Rio Branco ant bird and the hoary throated spine tail. And we've also started looking into wildfires and how they impact the environment and also how indigenous people are using um, the, the fires to manage the land. And finally, of course, most importantly for me and for this talk, are giant anteaters. But during this time, we've developed a really wonderful model for doing um, community conservation. And we're always trying to improve, we're always trying to grow, but we think that this is, a, this is a great model. We have rangers in all the villages that we work with, and those are people who are really committed to conservation and to the natural world. And these people, we train them in all the techniques and skills that they need, and then they go from their village and do the research, do the conservation work themselves. And we're very proud that we have an excellent mix of men and women taking part in all of the activities that we do. That's, that's due to a lot of hard work by some people to really encourage young women to be involved in, in everything. All right, so let's think a little bit about giant anteaters. I realized when I was practicing this um, presentation that I hadn't really put anything in about introducing giant anteaters. So um, giant anteaters, of course, are the largest of the anteater species. They mostly live on ants and termites. They are very sensitive to temperatures. They don't like to be too hot. They don't like to be too cold. Um, so for us in the Rupununi, we're only two degrees north of the equator. So that means that during the day, it's very hot and they're normally sleeping in the shade with their tail covering them during the day. And then they'll come out in the night or in the evenings to forage in the savannas. They are solitary, except when they have a baby with them, mostly. Um, and interestingly, there is really no clear sexual dimorphism. So this is, um, this is something we'll talk about later on, but um, basically very difficult to tell the difference between um, male and female giant anteaters or any anteaters because the, the sexual organs are internal. And in terms of um, their status, well, giant anteaters are considered to be vulnerable. Um, but in lots of parts of, of South America and Central America, they are um, endangered and have become locally extinct in some areas. So the population is generally in decline. So why did we want to study giant anteaters? Well, during this meeting that we had um, a few years ago now with all of our community members and our rangers, we asked, what are your concerns? You know, what are the concerns of the membership? And people said they were not seeing the numbers of giant anteaters that they used to see. Why was it? And we realized when we did some research that there is no baseline population estimate. There's no understanding about how many anteaters are in Guyana or in our part of Guyana. So if they were in decline, it would go unnoticed 
and we wouldn't be able to do anything about it. So we started our research and um, we did three main things to start with. We did um, in-depth interviews. Um, so we trained our rangers in the villages to speak to people, to conduct these structured interviews in their own language, whereby we would ask about um, where people see giant anteaters or how they feel about giant anteaters, what they know about them and also surrounding giant anteaters. And finally, how they would feel about um, conservation of giant anteaters. And we got so many amazing responses to this. Um, from that now, we started doing camera trapping and also patrols to see giant anteaters and to, um, to take photographs of them and to try and get some idea about how many they were and their activities. So this all led to three things, understanding the threats against giant anteaters, understanding local attitudes of giant anteaters, and then finally collecting and making baseline population estimates. And because we're a conservation society, this all has to lead towards something and it all has to lead towards um, conservation. So we use this to develop very specific conservation strategies for giant anteaters. And these conservation strategies have to be very specific to the communities that we're working with. And sometimes it's different community to community because the relationship between people and the anteaters is different in different communities. And then we were also using this to showcase the importance of the Rupununi habitat. Because people from outside can come in and they can look at the, the savannas and they see, you know, they see no infrastructure. They see no um, intensive farming or intensive ranching. There is no large scale agriculture. So people feel this is this land is wasted. But of course, it is not wasted. There's intrinsic and fantastic value of the land for the people and the animals that use it. So a lot of our work is, is, is promoting the, the value of this ecosystem. And finally, all of this about giant anteaters also acts as a, as a launching point to conservation strategies for other species and other habitats. So the anteater is almost like a, a gateway species because there's not really so much um, conflict between people and anteaters as there are between people and other species. So if we can learn to um, love and appreciate anteaters for their intrinsic qualities, then we can also think about how we can appreciate the other species as well. So now I'm going to talk about these threats, local attitudes, and um, how we're getting these baseline population estimates. Okay, so understanding threats. Um, main threats for us are fire. Um, as I said, the anteaters like to sleep in the daytime under the nice um, flammable grass and they cover themselves with their flammable tail and they sleep like the dead. So fire is a problem. If there's a big fire, it can really um, be very destructive, not just for the habitats, but for species like anteaters. Uh, as I said, we're um, doing a lot of work into understanding how fire impacts the landscape and also how indigenous people manage the landscape using fire, which is a very interesting um, topic of research. The next thing is trade. So what we found was that in the recent past, there had been people coming into the Rupununi, catching anteaters and then transporting them out probably to the coast. Um, and what they do with them there is a bit uncertain, but we think that possibly they were including them in um, groups of anteaters that were being bred and then sold, which is a completely illegal activity is taking things out of the wild. So and this is not happening in the South Rupununi now, but we think it's happening in other places. And this is something we need to be very vigilant against. Um, the next thing is, is hunting for food. So many villages do not eat anteaters. It's a taboo food, but some places they are eaten. The other thing is um, killing anteaters due to, I've called it superstitious reasons. And I'm going to go into that um, in a moment. 
but there is a complicated mythology and a complicated relationship between people and giant anteaters, which can often lead to people being afraid of anteaters, being very wary of anteaters, and that can lead to them being killed or being chased away or being injured. Now, the next thing we think about is ant poisons. Um, now, we don't have any empirical evidence at the minute to, to back this up, but we think that it's possible people who are using ant poisons to kill the ants that are destroying their farms, these poisons could be ingested by the giant anteaters and might have um, negative impacts on the health of the anteaters. So that's something that needs more work. And the final thing I have here in brackets is road traffic. Because for us in the, in the Rupanuri now, road traffic is very small, very limited but it's going to increase. And there is a new road that's being built through the region, through the North Rupununi from Brazil all the way to Georgetown. This is going to hugely increase the amount of road traffic. And this is something that's going to have a, a very strong, maybe devastating impact on many species, including giant anteaters in, in years to come. And I said, I talked a little bit about local attitudes and here I have some drawings to describe just a few of the things that we learned from these um, interviews we had with community members. And as I said, there's a, there's a very complicated mythology surrounding giant anteaters and how people feel about them and how they interact with them. On the bottom left, uh, you can see a typical story. And this is of a man, a fisherman, who has gone to catch fish with his bow and arrow. He goes into the water to collect his fish and his arrow. And he's grabbed by the Achilles tendon um, by a water anteater. And this water anteater is sort of a semi mythological animal, but um, people um, really believe in it. And in some cases, this water anteater is actually the male giant anteater. So it's linked to the giant anteater. In some cases, it's not male. Um, but in any case, this um, water anteater pulls the man under the water, takes him to a cave, and then goes and gets his masters, um, the jaguars, to come and kill the man. But luckily in this story, the, um, the man usually escapes. In the center, we have a depiction of um, a kanaima. A kanaima will be known by, uh, by all guides listening to this as a sort of a, a person who, who takes on or manipulates evil spirits or evil medicines um, and can turn himself into other animals, often to um, enact some kind of vengeance. And many times he takes on the shape of a giant anteater. Similarly, on the right, you can see um, another kind of a, um, of a person, um, this is a belief specific to a particular village, where the person shapeshifts into many different animals, including giant anteaters. And you'll notice that in these, in these pictures, the, um, the kanaima or the other um, creature still has the feet of a human. And if you know giant anteaters, you'll know that the back foot tracks of the giant anteater are just like little children's or like people's footprints. So you can sort of see the, the link there. So when I say, um, when I'm talking about this, I mean to say that there's, um, there's this relationship and people are very wary about giant anteaters, not because they're afraid of the anteaters themselves, but they're afraid of, um, of what the anteater might be. If it's not actually an anteater, it might be one of these, um, these um, canimas or people like this. But saying that, it's not the whole story at all, it's just part of the story. People also have um, a lot of respect, a lot of appreciation for giant anteaters as part of the as part of the landscape, as part of the natural world, a lot of understanding about giant anteaters. So here in the top left, we have an example of um, a mountain anteater. So some people say that they recognize different types of giant anteaters. You've got the anteater of the mountain, the anteater of the swamp, the anteater of the ite bush, the anteater of the savanna, and each one is distinctive. And then on the bottom right, you can see a picture of a, what a farmer has left for the anteater. He's left a bowl full of water because a lot of people recognize that the anteater comes into their farms and eats out all the terrible leaf cutter ants that would normally destroy their farms. So the anteater is a gift as well, is a partner um, to help with farming. 
So people do appreciate and love anteaters also. So you have to understand all of these things if we're going to um, have um, with our conservation efforts. So the next thing is baseline population estimates. How do we do that? Or how are we doing that? Well, the main strategy is through camera traps. So we've set up um, 59 camera trap stations in four communities. So that gives us a total of over 9,000 camera trap nights over the last couple of years. And going through all of that, we have um, oh, coming up to 900 occurrences of giant anteaters. So by an occurrence, I mean anteater comes in front of the camera, which is around, maybe leaves the, um, the front of the camera, but comes back a couple of minutes later, maybe walks around the camera, then reappears. This is one instance, one occurrence. But overall, we've got more than 1500 videos and they've all been gone through um, one by one. So as anybody who works with camera traps knows, it's wonderful, you get so much information, but oh my goodness, it takes a long time to go through all of that data. It's very time consuming. So what do we do? The main thing we do with our camera trap films and videos is we identify individual giant anteaters. So every giant anteater does look a little bit different. Sometimes they do look frustratingly similar. Sometimes it's very difficult to tell them apart. But I've shown, I've got an example here of two anteaters that are very easy to tell apart. On the left, we have Delilah. And on the right, we have Kester. And all of our anteaters ant that we've identified, which is now a total of 82, they all have their own names. So here we have Delilah and Kester. So how do we identify them? Well, let's look at, um, at Kester here. Kester has this lovely long white stripe. Um, and it goes all the way to his earlobe or her earlobe. We don't know if he's male or she's female. And also Delilah has this mark, but you see it's quite thick here and it doesn't continue all the way to the ear. Um, Kester now it has, a, of course, a diagonal black stripe here. And so does Delilah. In these two anteaters, they look kind of similar-ish, but sometimes this, um, this black diagonal stripe will be quite a different shape, size, or thickness. And then also the white underneath can vary in size and thickness. But for these two anteaters, the most distinguishing thing is, of course, the markings on the front leg. So Delilah has a big black mark um, on her leg here. And Kester doesn't really. He has a slight, um, a slight shading. And for animals that do have this mark on their leg, they can be different shapes and sizes. So I use that along with the other leg markings, like the size of this um, ankle bracelet, this foot, the size and shape of this white mark here. Um, and sometimes also the back foot can help as well, along with scars or cuts, holes in the ears, this kind of thing. Use all of that to develop sort of descriptive ID cards for every single giant anteater that we know. So we learn where they live, where their territory is, their home range. We also find out which anteaters um, we, we cannot recognize or we, we haven't identified and where they are. And then we feed all this into a program, into a model, and hopefully the analysis is still in progress, but hopefully we will end up with um, our lovely baseline population estimates, which we can take in future years and compare and see if we're seeing an increase or decrease in the anteater population. So now, as well as all of this um, um, description, behavior of the anteaters. So very early on, people took us to see these locations, which I'm going to show you just now, right now, um, where anteaters are using the trees in particular ways. And many of our camera traps were set up to record this particular behavior. So I'm going to show it to you now. Here we go. Here's an anteater. Bless me, I don't know which anteater that is. Um, but here, here he goes, scratching reaching up, climbing up the tree, up, 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 rubbing against the tree, comes down, scratches, scratches, rubs again, 
and off he goes. So this is the behavior that we started to see. We were very excited about. I hadn't seen this described in any literature about anteaters. And here's another example. This time, uh, a mother with a, a little pup on her back, or quite a big pup, I should say, on her back, and she's engaging in the same behavior. Of course, the pup is a but she gets it too much. So when we set up our camera traps, most of them we put at trees just like this, where the anteaters were marking the trees and climbing the trees. And we have now got um, more than 400 separate occurrences of anteaters using these trees to mark them, scratching them, rubbing against them, or climbing them. And out of those 125, more than 200 are where the anteater actually climbs the tree up to sometimes more than a meter. He gets, he or she gets the back feet off the ground more than a meter. Sometimes it's just a few centimeters and then comes down again. So we have so much data now about um, which anteaters are engaging in this behavior, male, female, we have some information about that, the size that they are, um, if there's some kind of social hierarchy, um, the locations, the time of year, the time of day, putting all this information together. So we're supposed to um, um, create something for publication very soon, it's almost finished. And we'll put all these ideas together. So I've talked about this um, threats, local attitudes, and baseline population estimates. And as an offshoot of that, understanding about habits um, of the anteater. But now I'll talk a little bit about how this leads to conservation. Okay, so this is something lovely. Um, I think I said earlier that we'd started off doing our research in one particular village, which is our pilot village, and then we've expanded. So there's now four communities, but we started off in this village. This is Katanarib. And due to our, you know, so much conversation involving the community, involving the rangers so much, the village, the village council and the village leaders, backed up by the community, decided that they would um, set up a giant anteater community conservation zone. So this is a place which is the whole of the, uh, the land belonging to the village, which is protected and managed by the community and where giant anteaters are safe and, and protected. It's something we're very proud of, but we think it's just the start. So it's just one, um, one village, but we think and we, we know then that this is something that is going to expand. And here, this, um, this screen here shows just a few of the other conservation activities that have come out of this work. So, um, for example, on the top left, we have Krista, one of our rangers. She's holding up the 2022 Giant Anteater SRCS calendar. There's one of those in almost every house, in a household in the South of Bunny. So people are um, able to look at that every day and see a lovely conservation message on it. On the right, you can see children, pupils and teachers of the Sand Creek Secondary School. So as well as having the secondary school engage in our environmental education program, these children are also um, using the raw data from our camera traps. They're taking that data and incorporating it into their school-based assessments, which is like the coursework for their end of school exams. They're incorporating them into their school-based assessments for maths and science. And using that data to come up with their own um, results and think of their own conservation messages that come out of that. So we want the data to be used in as many ways as possible, not just by us, but by everybody in, in communities, in the villages, and also um, policymakers as well. On the bottom left, you can see the draft front cover of a, uh, a storybook that is in the final stages of production. And this is a storybook, which is about a little girl living in the south of Upanuni, and she sees giant anteaters and she wants to know more about them. So she goes and asks relatives, friends, teachers, rangers, village leaders, about anteaters, finds out about different stories, mythologies, 
and also experiences and research and start to understand more about um, conservation activities that the villages are doing to protect anteaters. And then, of course, she comes away with her own lovely um, conservation, conservation message. So this is supposed to go um, very soon back into villages and homes. So people have this at home, which is really just a guidebook with so, so much information about um, giant anteaters and how we can look after them. Then on the bottom right, this is, I think this is something really lovely. This is something we started doing last year, but it's really increased. We hold nature fairs. So these are events in villages or where one village hosts several villages. And it's a whole day of celebration of wildlife and of the natural habitat and of the work that communities are doing to protect the environment. So this one, this picture here, is of um, Suwariwa village. It says Suwariwa village conservation areas help us to protect, conserve, and care for all endangered species. And that includes, of course, the giant anteater. So this is the fun day. Everybody's involved. We have scavenger hunts. We have tree planting. We have art competitions. We have um, all kinds of activities that involve everybody in the community. And it's a real time where there can be communication and dialogue between people in the SRCS, other people in the community, leaders. But we have this in a fun, um, inclusive and involved way. And out of that are coming a lot of new ideas of how to really um, incentivize um, conservation activities. And the final thing I've got here in the middle, this is an example of how we've moved beyond um, just giant anteater conservation, even within this um, giant anteater conservation project, because we wanted, as I said, the giant anteaters to be a sort of a, uh, a springboard to other species. So in Katunarib, which is the example I gave you of where they're setting up um, a community managed conservation zone, the village is very interested in not just protecting giant anteaters, but going beyond that to develop a plan for natural resource management. So this photograph shows us that a focus group meeting where we're discussing how we can take steps to manage the, um, all the natural resources in the village in a more proactive way. And while the village is responsible for coming up with the plans, SRCS can facilitate this, and we can also help link the village to other groups, governmental organizations, other NGOs, to help the village with whatever needs that they need to undertake the particular activities um, that will um, um, manage these um, natural resources. And then finally, almost finally, uh, I like this picture. This is a picture of some of our first bird watching students out in the middle of the savannas. And um, it just sort of explains our motto, which is through education, research and conservation, we're dedicated to sustaining and caring for the plants, animals and people of the Rupununi. And this is the whole aim really. Um, we're hoping that if we keep working and working and include as many people as possible and as many voices as possible, then um, we will be able to um, protect and care for the Rupuruni and all of the amazing people and animals that live there and call this amazing place home. And I'll finish with this video. Um, and while you're watching this video, you could ask, think of any questions that you'd like to ask. A very private moment that is being captured. Well, that was fantastic.
And we do have a couple of questions. So if you would like to type in the chat box, uh, Erin Earl is here live, so she's happy to answer your questions. And just type them yeah. into the chat box. Hello, everybody. Good evening. I feel like I've traveled back in time. I can see myself on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, there I am. <laughs> All right. And there you are in real life. <laughs> All right. Very good. So I'll start. Uh, we have a couple of questions, and then we encourage. We're so happy that so many people came. Um, so thank you, Erin, for your networking. But I will ask you a couple of questions. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this, but can you tell us where giant anteaters live in addition to your region? Oh, well, giant anteaters um, all through northern South America. So right down to northern Argentina, where they were reintroduced recently. And then, but in a lot of Central America, they're not there anymore. So they're they're already extinct or thought to be extinct in most of Central America. Yes, but for the rest of um, the rest of Northern South America, yes, um, they've got quite a large range. Mm -hmm. um, so we have one person who wants to know, have you compared your data results with other sites, like example, Brazil? But I don't know exactly what data point they're referring to. Well, I think this question was, um, was written whenever we were talking about the camera trap data and the baseline population estimates. So um, yes, indeed, as I said, we haven't um, finished analyzing all the data. We're still trying to get some help to do that. Um, but um, right now, our minimum population estimate correlates with population estimates done in the Brazilian Cerrado recently. Um, so we're, we're thinking that it's probably similar or hopefully higher than that, because these are just our minimum estimates at the, at the time. Um, so right now we're looking at about 0 0.3 individuals per kilometer squared, which we think is probably quite a healthy, a healthy number. But the thing that's really special about the environment is not just the, the density of giant anteaters, but this, that it's a, it's a very large um, uninterrupted space for giant anteaters. And so I suppose if you if we go back to your, your first question about the range of the species, yes, they're over South America, but of course this is this is broken up a lot by um, by farming, by cities, by roads, etc. But in the Rupununi, we don't have these things. Um, and in fact, in Guyana, uh, giant anteaters are found in in all parts of the of the um, the whole country. And there are some people on this this um, webinar right now, I can see um, Brian who has um, video footage of giant anteaters in mangroves and other people who have camera trap footage of giant anteaters up in the tallest hills, up mountains that you have to scramble up. So they, they use all parts of the habitat. All right, so speaking of habitat, Mindy would like to know how much of the savanna is natural and how much is the result of human deforestation or cattle ranching? This is a very interesting question, um, but the the answer is that it's considered to be a natural, completely natural savanna. Now, the the how the savanna started in the first place is a question that is not well known, but we're talking about the start of this, the, the creation of this savanna being, oh, maybe um, 10,000 or more years ago. So it's certainly not created by humans in, in recent times. It's not, it's not a result of, of pasteurization or cattle farming at all. It's a natural grassland, yeah. Nick would like to know, does your study include any health-related uh, data investigations on giant anteaters? Well, no, it doesn't. Um, we don't have any vets in our group who would be able to to, to do this, um, we'd, we would like to, to start involving involving this um, aspect of research, not just for giant anteaters, but for other species as well. But we, we're not able to do this yet. Yes. So uh, watching your presentation, of course, I was inspired as well as others. And I don't know if Julia is a veterinarian, but she would like to know, do you take remote volunteers to help with your research? maybe like analyzing the data? Oh, 
Yes, definitely, Julia. You, <laughs> you could email me later. Absolutely. Uh, we 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 are we're always looking for expertise. We're always looking for people to link with, um, both in the field and externally. So um, right now, with with very generous help from um, our funders, um, we've been able to build a. Um, a research station right at Wichibai, where I was talking about in the start. And um, from, oh, anti-teacher zookeeper, brilliant. <laughs> that, that's a good so, connection. <laughs> very good. So there we have our research station and we have um, bedrooms there. And we really, we're trying, now that the pandemic is supposed to be pretty much over, um, we're trying to have, get as many people as possible from other institutions, universities, zoos, et cetera, link with them and please to come and join, um, join us, do research in the Rupununi, um, link up with the SRCS and SRCS members can be your local counterparts. And from there, you could, we could do all kinds of research because it's really, Rupununi is an amazing place because pretty much any question that you ask hasn't been answered here, even to you know, which, which species are, are, in, are in this country or in the Rupununi. We don't even have a good list, you know, we don't know. So, and even for the large species, there's so many different things to find out. Like, for example, this anteater's climbing trees, you know, there, there it's been in front of everyone's eyes all along, but of course it hasn't been recorded or written about um, scientifically. So you can take even a big anti animal like an anteater that people see every day and, you know, just, just a very little amount of work, you can discover all kinds of interesting things about them. Yeah. And because it's, this, it's quite a small community um, in the, the whole Rupununi then, there's real uh, space to, to do impactful work, I think. So things that you do, um, can can really make a difference for the, actually for the whole country, and that's because Guyana is is it has a small population, um, and so you can you can do a lot in terms of conservation. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to my question. My question was, how large is the community where the children are using the data, the real world data in the classroom and analyzing it? Because that to me is so in inspiring and powerful that they're not reading you know, not just about like killer whales or something that they don't see, but they're reading about an animal that they're familiar with that is actually in their country, maybe not even in their country, but in their neighborhood. And then they're seeing, you know, the results of that. So I was just wondering how, how far are you spreading those uh, data results? Mm -hmm. So that um, so the Rupununi, as I said, is lots of small villages, and most of those villages have only primary schools, and then they send their children to one of three um, high schools in the region. So the high school that I'm talking about that is, is, is the main one for most of the, the south central um, Rupununi district. So that's most of the kids from the communities that we'll be working with will be going to that school. But as well as that, we share all of our data with each of the villages that we work in. And it's not just us, though. Most um, researchers or most people who are working in Rupununi would do that. Um, that's, not really the, that's not really the problem. The, the thing is uh, working out how to make that um, interesting and applicable to people. So we, it's all very well sharing all of your camera trap data, right? That's, that's fine. But I mean, really, that's hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. No one's going to look at that again. So the, the key is working out how to, um, how to develop school projects and um, use them in the classroom. And I really like your, um, your classroom games and puzzles and videos and stuff because we have, of course, we have our environmental education classes in lots of primary schools. So we're gonna see how we can integrate those into the lessons as well. I think that'll be really good. Very yes. good. So right now we have all those sloth activities on zenarthrins.org. Yes. In two weeks, we'll be having, uh, I think, 12 anteater activities in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. To follow up on that uh, real world data, do you, how many hours did it take you or someone else to turn it into something that was digestible for the high schoolers? Do you think, uh, other scientists and other countries could also be sharing their data like this, or should they be sharing their data like this? Well, of course, because it's really ins it's really inspiring the kids to get involved. So we're not just sharing the data, though. We um, 
we're also sharing the equipment. So for example, in Sand Creek for their um, school-based assessments, um, we'll share, we've shared camera traps with them. So one of our rangers goes out into the field with the, with the group and helps them to set the camera traps. So then they can use those camera traps to collect the data. Then we will um, take part in the classroom to help the kids to analyze the results. So, so that they're able to um, monitor the area near the school um, and hopefully it'll be year after year. So then there'll be a lot of data generated for those kids to continue to, to understand the ecosystem next to them. And hopefully it'll, it'll really incentivize them to protect it, but not just that. I mean, they should be able to go home and explain the same thing to their families so that this, this, this practice is, is throughout the whole area. Yeah. But for um for how long it took it, it took a very very long time but that's because we had so many camera traps and i wasn't just going through and and just counting the number of anteaters of course each anteater has to be identified and that is very 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 slow process so it took a very long time to do that mm -hmm. i don't know if you know before you got there or before you started sharing the data, and I don't know if it's changed, but what do um, the children historically, what are their careers, you know, post high school graduation historically? Because it seems like a lot of people are doing uh, natural work, you know, tourism things. Yeah, so the, um, so most people, if they, Hmm, that's a good question. Um, if people stay in the village, they uh, there's quite a lot of government work. So there'd be teachers, health workers, people who work in the village like this. Um, also, of course, um, people rely on subsistence farming um, and hunting a lot. So a lot of people wouldn't have professions as such, um, but would be farmers. And that's how they're um, um, maintaining their families. But there's a big, uh, there's a a large number of, of young people who leave the community completely. So they'll either travel to the nearest town, which is Lethem, or up to the city Georgetown, or very commonly for us into Brazil and work in Brazil. So there's a lot of a lot of kids that leave and never come back. But I mean, some some are coming back. But the problem is, of course, that is a big brain drain because those children who are the brightest <laughs> leave and like everywhere else they leave and everyone's English speaking. So um, they're in demand all over the place. Um, and those kids that leave often don't come back again. So what we're, one of the things that we're trying to do is, is get scholarships, is to encourage um, more employment in the area, in tourism, yes, and also in, in research, in conservation, to bring more money into the area, to have people who are employed in, in, um, in, in jobs in conservation and tourism that they can make good money in, right? And this is very difficult to do. It takes a very long time. Yeah. Ramona would like to know, are there any Peace Corps volunteers involved in the research or environmental education? So uh, Peace Corps was in this part of Guyana a few years ago, but I don't think they're here anymore. Um, certainly we don't work with Peace Corps now. Yes. All right. I do have a couple of private comments that say, uh, like, I'll, I'll say it was from Christian. He says, congratulations to uh, your community and Aaron for all the great work and inspiration to the younger students. And I have a couple of other thank yous, fantastic um, presentation. And we're just about out of time. So we wanna thank Aaron Earl for a fantastic presentation. It will be posted on our social media, Facebook and YouTube, probably late tomorrow. And uh, we encourage all of the participants to come next week and the week after for the next two webinars. And if you know someone who does research with anteaters, armadillos, or sloths and think they would be a great uh, host, please uh, send them my way because we are booking for 2023 right now. So thank you, Erin, so much. We appreciate you sharing your passion for that region and uh, the giant anteater. Thank you very much.